Now Denise Miner transports us to a stormy Scottish isle in a ghostly tale, written especially for BBC Radio Scotland listeners, which no man shall put asunder. They arrived at the castle the morning before, driving from the ferry in Lila's car, packed with clinking boxes of drink, the dresses and an elaborate cake in the shape of a giant white rose. It was a small island, a tiny verdant speck of Gulf Stream palm trees on the very edge of the vicious grey Atlantic. Lila took the pothole drive slowly, but Martha wasn't smiling. They had camped down on the beach near here when they were little, with their parents, long before the fire. It was only built in the 30s, but the architect's young son had fallen from the roof and died and was said to walk the battlements. Not really scary. Not scary like standing on the grass in the meadows in bare feet, watching a soot-blackened fireman walk around from the back of the house, catch the eye of his commanding officer and shake his head. Not scary like bare feet on cold, wet grass and a shadow flailing in a bright, burning window. The memories of the tent were why Lila wanted to marry here. It was a way of their parents being present. Martha was sad to see Lila dragging together the remnants of her family to present to her fiancé, the ghost of their parents, re-establishing contact with Martha when they hadn't been in touch for four years. No big fight, just drift and mutual suspicion. Martha hadn't met the groom, Harry, but then Lila hadn't met John either. And Martha and John had been together forever. She couldn't refuse to be the maid of honour. It would have been yet another betrayal. The key ground the lock open and they shoved into a gorgeous wood-panelled hall. For a split second it looked gorgeous and then the smell hit them. Lila was dismayed. (gasps) It stinks of damp. They wandered through the hall into the public rooms beyond Threadbare furniture, damp, chill, doors and wood panels split from the cold, light bulbs gone and no spares in the cupboards. Dingy, awful, just awful. She found Lila holding three boxes of fire lighters. We'll set fires in all the rooms, she said lightly, as if it meant nothing. But they couldn't look at each other. Lila's friends all arrived on the last ferry of the night. They'd made suggestions. Let's spray perfume, open the windows for a while, as if it would make any difference. Harry, Lila's fiancé, was not what Martha would have expected. Not at all good-looking when Lila was hypnotically beautiful. He was annoyed that the house smelled, annoyed at Lila. He said that his mother would go mad when she got here. Harry's mother didn't make it. The florist phoned to say that the ferries were cancelled because of the storm, but the caterers were based on the island and the minister was there, so they just decided to go ahead. The caterers consisted of one very fat woman with grubby cuffs on her anorak. She came in a van laid out all the tinfoil trays, gave instructions for the venison haunch and dauphinois potatoes, and then she commented on the smell. Oh, it's damp, said Lila. Mildew. Nah, said the woman. Too sweet for mildew. That's something else, that. That's a dead thing. Hung meat. It goes rank like that before it loses its smell. After she left, Lila called everyone together and they searched every single room. Martha and John took a torch and ventured down to the dark cellar. The groundwater seeped over the rim of her Uggs and John had to steady her arm as she stepped carefully back to the stairs. Bizarre, he said. 
because the wood in the house is as dry as kindling. The minister arrived and they gathered in the flowerless main room. Lila wept under her veil, pretending she was moved when Martha could see that she was heartbroken. Lila and Harry sat at the end of the table, less like celebrants than co-accused. Lila didn't eat and Harry got very, very drunk. And then the whole thing was over. No one lingered. No one danced. Everyone retreated to their rooms abruptly. The light in Martha and John's room was roomy yellow because the bulbs were old and dust burned into them. Poor Lila, said John, smoking a cigarette on the sofa. I just want to get out of here, she said. I just want to get warm, he said. She unzipped her bridesmaid's dress, the pink bodice peeling away from her like petals on a dying rose, when a sudden gust of bitter cold streamed under the door. <gasps> God! She pulled on her dressing gown. What the hell is that? John watched her open the door to the dark landing. She felt her ankles freeze as if plunged into icy water. At the bottom of the staircase, beyond the great hall, the front door was wide open to the black storm. She bolted downstairs, watched by the deer, firelight exciting their glassy eyes. She saw Harry then, slumped, asleep in an armchair in front of the fire. It was Lila. She had opened the front door and stood outside, her sodden wedding dress clinging to her legs, pale as chalk, clutching herself around the waist. She turned to Martha and whispered through blue lips, Everything is ruined. Martha stepped out into the storm and took her little sister's hand. Come into the warm, Lila. She came in and Martha shut the door and locked it and took the key and put it in her pocket. She watched her sad little sister walk upstairs, cold and wet and lonely, towards the bridal suite. Lila glanced back to Martha and she smiled, as if glad they were friends now. She raised a hand as if to say goodbye and then she disappeared into the dark. Harry stirred in his chair. And then John was next to Martha, smiling, telling her to watch. He lifted his cigarette to his mouth and sucked, concentrating as he breathed in all the smell of the house, all the sadness of the day, all the tears of Lila, puffing his chest out until it bowed out like a balloon, massive, he breathed in until his feet lifted off the floor, up, 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 until he hung high in the hall, ten feet off the floor, his chest massively distended. And then, smiling, holding Martha's eye, he opened his mouth wide, wide, wide and breathed out a long gust of cleansing red flame. He singed the hair on a stag's face, suiting its nose. He smiled down at Martha, and Martha smiled back. Go on then, he whispered. She walked past Harry her wet dressing gown slacking heavy around her shins to the edge of the ingle nook fireplace. Lifting the heavy brass tongs, she scissored them around a glowing red coal in the hearth and set it down as carefully as she would a baby on top of the open box of fire starters. Only this time, she stayed to walk.